Uh, Sam and I uh, went back many years, and uh, we are good friends and also a good colleague. Uh, he joined Harvard Statistics uh, Department in 2002. Uh, before that, uh, he, uh, he got his uh, bachelor degree from Peking University and then PhD from Stanford University. Uh, and, and then uh, he joined Harvard, and uh, we have been working together on some very interesting uh, topics before. Uh, one thing uh, I uh, worked a little bit with him was on single molecule data analysis, but later on he carried uh, a much longer way and uh, has done some uh, very influential work uh, for single uh, molecule uh, community. And uh, uh, Sam uh, got many awards, and uh, I will mention two. Uh, one is a real award, another is not. Uh, he got the COPS award, which is uh, 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 one of the most pre prestigious uh, awards in statistics given annually to one individual under age 40 uh, by five leading statistical societies. And, and another significant achievement is he's the second person in the Harvard statistics history uh, who clapped climbed the ladder all the way from assistant professor to a full professor. Uh, the, the previous one was a uh, famous uh, Arthur Dempster who retired uh, 10 years ago about. <laughs> so, so, so the gap is about 50 some years between, <laughs> between the first and second. Uh, okay, without further ado, here I give you the pr Professor Samuel Cole. He will tell us about his work in electronic uh, medical record. Thank you, uh, can you hear me? Thank you very much, June, for the introduction. The second part uh, just says this, our department is very small. In the, for a long, 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 long time, there are only four, three tenured faculty members in the Department of Statistics. That's to that put in the context. And so, okay, as June mentioned, what I'm trying to do today is to give a sort of introduction about our work in our, in our adventure in dealing with electro, electronic health data. Um, so I'll tell, tell you what we did and what we're looking, at, looking after, and also some lessons we learned and some insight we gained from this process. So this talk is based on joint work with uh, Shi Hao Yang, who is currently a PhD student in the Department of Statistics, and Quin Xin Yu, who is a Harvard Data Science Fellow, and, and my collaborator, Zach Cahoney in the Harvard Medical School. And you can see that's a, also other courses involved as well. And so what I'm trying to do is to talk about uh, big medical data, applications on big medical data. So let's, uh, this is a big data conference. So let me say a few words of big data. We all heard of big data, and that's why we're here today. And as a matter of fact, whether we like it or not, everyone, everyone of us pretty much involved in some big data online platforms one way or the other. For example, when you do Google, when you do Facebook, or when you do Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn, and so on, you already not only participate in the big data platforms, but also you add, we all actually actively contribute our own effort to their data collection. So as a matter of fact, the size of data is keep on growing, almost like exponential fast. Uh, for that, I'll quote uh, Eric, uh, Eric Schmidt, uh, the former CEO of Google, the current uh, executive chairman of Google. This is what he said a few years ago. There were five exabytes of information created between the dawn of civilization through 2003, but that much of information is now created every two days. I think, I, I want to make two comments. First of all, what is exabytes? Exabytes is 10 to the 18th power, so that's billion, billion. Secondly, I think the word created probably is not the most accurate word. Probably should be recorded. During the medieval times, this information created, but they just don't have the means to record them. But now on Facebook, everything you did is recorded. You hate someone, you like someone, that's already in the Facebook record. Even if you decided 30 seconds later to delete it, but then it's, what you did before is already part of the, in the official record. And this development availability of big data and humongous amount of data create a lot of excitement, not only in the academic environment like today, but also in government, industry, and business uh, communities. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you go around ask for talk about big data, you will realize that the vast majority of conversations of excitement or development about big data happens outside the academic world. For example, if you go to Wall Street, 
you'll find people talking about big data. If you go to Silicon Valley, you hear people talk about big data. If you go to pharmaceutical industry, you hear people talk about big data. If you go to FDA, you hear people talk about F uh, big data. Even the CIA and FBI are talking about using big da data to catch terrorists and so on. And so to a certain extent, I think for big data applications, the key question is that how do you translate such a huge amount of data into something that's useful for the decision making? That decision making can be decision making for business or decision making for the society or the decision making from your doctors or healthcare providers to provide a better service or better treatment for you. So in this talk, uh, we're going to look at uh, big medical data. Uh, so big, this is a, here is a partial list of the availability of uh, different forms of big medical data. So let's go over them. First, electronic health record. And Probably uh, starting from 25 to 30 years, 25 or 20 years ago, uh, different hospitals and uh, healthcare providers start to switch from the paper ver paper record to electronic health record. So that in that gives the doctors easy way to access your data, enter your information, retrieve information, and modify information. So that's the initial purpose. And so that we have huge amount of record of electronic health record. The second, why the uh, sort of huge data side, uh, the insurance record, medical insurance record, that mainly com com uh, contains uh, diagnosis, uh, billing information for procedures, uh, billing information for your pharmaceutical need, uh, pharmaceutical uh, drugs taking, and so on. And so these two data sets are by far very large. And they, each, this data set actually, in certain sense, two data sets complements each other. For the electronic health record, that's very granular. For example, it not only contains the uh, diagnosis, but also contains your lab test, and it also contains doctor's written notes. That is actually very useful information in many cases than just looking at the, uh, the disease codes and so on. And however, the electronic health record tend to be fragmented in the sense that suppose you switch hospital from one to other, chances are that two hospitals are not linked together. So your data are fragmented. That happens, for example, if you move your home from one town to other. Chances are you go to a different hospital, healthcare provider, and then your electronic health record are disjoint. So two pieces fragmented from each other. Where the insurance record is not granular, the so insurance record doesn't contain doctor's handwritten, uh, the written notes and so on. However, the insurance, uh, insurance record are relatively complete in the sense that even if you switch hospitals, as long as you are under the same insurance plan, your, uh, your house is actually ref reflected there. And of course, uh, if you switch different insurance plans, uh, things will change. But chances are, mo for mo most of us, we don't switch insurance plans that, that often. The biggest exception is that when people reach Medicare age 65 and so on, you switch to the Medicare and Medicaid. That, that's a diff, that's a one major switch, and so that's these are the two available uh, large data, uh, large medical uh, medical data sets. The next one is medical imaging, and not in that case. We're talking about X-ray data, uh, your CT scan data, your PET scan data, and so on. And the size of medical imaging can easily go to terabytes and beyond. That's easy. And then that's a genomic sequence data. The genomic data uh, ranges from a detection, range of your test for single genes or a few genes or multiple genes to whole sequence, whole sequence, a whole genome sequence. So that is available, become more and more available for a lot of patients. Then there's pharmaceutical research uh, notes. And this includes the public uh, publication, public available data. For example, uh, there's a lot of publications, millions of publications at PubMed each year talking about associations between different chemical, uh, chemical, uh, chemical compounds or proteins to different disease conditions. That's one uh, source of uh, pharmaceutical record. And also in each of the pharmaceutical companies, there's a lot of research notes left there in their database. But that's more like a private database. But these are the available big data big medical data. Uh, then there comes the uh, variable devices. The variable devices for Fitbit and so on, not only tells, tells you how many steps you work on, and also measures your blood pressure, measures your heartbeat, and so on. Some of medical device, some of the variable devices also tells, accurate, can accurately measure your blood sugar. But in, uh, in real time, that also gives you a way to say whether your, most your blood sugar rise 
quickly after taking rice, or after taking bread, or after taking a spaghetti, and so on. So that gives you fine control. And the wearable devices now, some of the wearable devices all actually also have some pre uh, warning signal, for example, especially for all elder people. You see, you're gonna, you have a danger of falling, be careful, stuff like that. So the wearable devices become more and more balanced, uh, available nowadays, prevalent. And all these available, here is just a partial list. The list actually goes on and on and on. And all this opens up a lot of interesting potentials. So for example, one potential will be discovering new cures. For example, you're mining the pharmaceutical data sets, research record, you might find uh, association, a uh, very effective association between putting certain chemical compound and disease condition. Maybe that will lead to new uh, drugs. Alternatively, if you mine the electronic health record or um, insurance record, chance that you might find that once in a while, some treatment, some drugs designed from other condition actually happens to be useful for other, uh, other things as well. One concrete example would be Viagra, which is previously was originally designed to treat a heart disease, but later on find it useful for a different purpose. So that's one co concrete example. Or you can find uh, side effects of treatment, especially the uh, emerging treatment, new treatment, and then you can try to mind the data set trying to find association and try to find the causal, causal relationships between the treatment versus side effect. And you, well, then this opens the door of precision medicine in the sense that if you look at a patient past history and disease history or uh, health history, and maybe you can decide for this condition, the best treatment is this rather than that. For example, two patients having the same, for example, skin disease might have different treatment. One is give you a steroid, the other give a, a different medication to take, and so on. So that's why we're talking about precision medicine. And also allows you to, potentially allows people to, to predict disease. Given the situation, maybe in the next six months, something that's higher chance of this disease to develop for this patient, then you have to be careful. The doctors should notify the patient. The patient will take preventive actions. And in concretely, for example, so suppose the patient wants to do an open heart surgery, and then given the past history, there's a higher chance that major bleeding happens. Then probably before the treatment, you should give, uh, the doctors will give the patient some medications to alleviate the potential uh, complication. And then also, this all translates in the economic terms, translate to more efficient healthcare system, potentially, and reducing the cost for the healthcare providers as well as for the patients. That's a big picture. And Another thing is uh, the combination of uh, online platforms, social networks, as well, for example, Google, or Facebook, and so on, uh, as well as the electronic health record and insurance record gives you a way to mapping diseases and try predict infectious diseases. So in the past, in collaboration with many excellent uh, co-authors, we work on mapping disease and tracking. Also, we work on mining the data set. Uh, PubMed public data set to find association between different proteins and, and, and disease. But in today, I'm going to talk about the side effects uh, of new treatment, emerging treatment, and our discovery and our analysis. In particular, we're going to talk about a side effect of cancer immunotherapy. And cancer immunotherapy is one of the, I think, breakthroughs in the past three years. And the first uh, cancer immunotherapy drug approved by FDA is in 2014. And later on, starting from 2015 and onward, there's a lot more drugs approved by FDA for cancer immunotherapy. So the basic idea of immunotherapy sort of, in certain sense, is a regime changing for thinking about how to treat cancer. Either. In the traditional people think about, uh, let's tr design some compound to directly hit the cancer cell, okay? directly to hit the cancer uh, tumor. But immunotherapy turns the way around, says, what if we try to tune up your immune system so that your immune system, T cells and other things, can directly attack cancer rather, rather than through external compound? And so this has, a, uh, has generated a lot of excitement in the cancer treatment. And it, it, as I mentioned, it has become an important part of treating some certain types of cancer. And in certain cases, that's a regime changing. People switch from uh, chemotherapy to uh, immunotherapy, you can see. Uh, and this, of course, not on the general excitement, but in the general, by the doctors and so on, oncologists, is also generated a lot of excitement in the public media. 
And eventually, actually, if you Google in all the public media, you'll find some articles here or there discussing about immunotherapy. So here are two articles from New York Times. And you can see, I won't read the details, but basically say cancer immunotherapy offers hope and provides a very interesting result and so on. Here's from Wall Street Journal. Uh, also talk about a cancer immunotherapy uh, uh, treatment for breast cancer. And here's a CNN, uh, cancer immunotherapy uh, provides uh, remarkable, remarkable treatment for lung cancer patient and so on. And so, okay, so before I talk about the side effect, before I talk about our analysis about the, uh, the undesired consequences of immunotherapy, let's first talk, uh, spend a few words, talk about the specific cancer immunotherapy that we're gonna looking at. Uh, just, we can, now we have to start from our own immune system because we're using immunotherapy using our own immune system to fight cancer. So immuno, uh, our, one important part our immune system is to defend our normal cell from the invaders, virus, fungus, or bacteria, and as well as abnormal cells. And so a, a crucial part is for the immune system to recognize who is a, guy, who is a bad guy, who is a, a good guy. So the immune system should leave the normal cells alone and start concentrating attacking the invaders or abnormal cells. Okay, one uh, mechanism for our body to regulate uh, the immune response to avoid onset of autoimmune disease, which is the case that immune cell, your own immune cell start to attack normal, normal bodies, that's autoimmune disease. To avoid no, auto, uh, this uh, de development of autoimmune disease is so-called immune checkpoints. So one of the important immune checkpoints is so-called a PD-1, PD-L1 checkpoint. So here's a diagram. So uh, let's, let's talk about normal cell. In normal cell, it often, very often happens that in normal cell on the cell membrane, that's a lot of antigens. So these antigens attract T cells to bind to them. However, for our own body, in order to avoid the T cells to attack the normal cells, there's some pathway, so-called PD-1 and PD-L1 pathway. And the PD-1 is a protein that binds to the membrane of T cell. And PD-L1 is a counterpart, binds to the membrane of the normal cell. So when the PD-L1 and PD-1 binds to each other, it signals to the T cell that this is a good guy, this is our own guy, so leave it alone, go away. So when the binding of PD-1 and PD-L1 happens, and it blocks, it essentially deactivates the T cell, so T cell goes away, won't attack the normal tissue, a normal cell. So that's how our immune system tries, one of the ways our immune system tries to regulate our immune response. Unfortunately, the same way our immune system regulates to tune down T cell is also hijacked by many cancer cells. In many, many cancer cells, there are lots of PD-L1 uh, proteins on the surface of a cancer, t a cancer cell. So the cancer cell, in, because there's a lot of PD-L1s, it binds to PD-1 and then send a false signal to the T cell, this is a good guy and don't do, don't do much damage, go away. And so that's a way, one of the major ways for the cancer cell to avoid, avoid being attacked by T cell. So that generates the idea of checkpoint inhibitor. What, these are the small proteins designed to bind with either PD-1 or PD-L1. Once they bind to PD-1 or PD-L1, uh, they prevent the binding of uh, PD-1s and PD-L1, and so that blocks the signal pathway for the uh, cell, for the cancer cell to send a false signal to the, our T cell. So that give, enables T cell to start to, uh, to attack the uh, tumor cell, start to kill the tumor cell. So that's a basic idea of checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, this idea later on developed to a lot of uh, blockbuster uh, commercial drugs. For example, right now in the market, uh, the, there's a lot of, these are the drugs, partial list of the drugs approved by FDA, either block PDL, PD-1 or blocks PDL one And the, by far, these two are the most prevalent drugs, and they're under the name Pembrolizumab, Lizumab, Nivolumab, and so on. And you notice that these names are a lot of uh, difficult to pronounce, so, but many of the drug companies have uh, trade names over them. For example, the, first, the treatment for pembrolizumab is Kichuda. The treatment name for nivolumab is Optivo, and so on. Uh, Kichuda is a billion dollar drug for Merck. So now each, each year it generates billions of dollars revenue for, for, Mer for Merck. 
Okay, so now what we're looking at now are the undesirable consequences of immunotherapy. And the intuition is actually relatively straightforward. Since PD-1, PD-L1 is an important part of our body to regulate uh, immune system to uh, prevent autoimmune diseases, now you interrupt the pathway. Uh, chances are you might disrupt the, the normal regulation of uh, immune response, and that, that might lead to autoimmune disease. You block the binding in cancer cells, chances are you also have to block the binding of normal cells. And in, in fact, the onset of autoimmune disease has been reported by doctors, but in more anecdotal level or in case reports level. So far, as far as we know, there's no uh, population study or there's no st systematic studies to study uh, to, to address the effect of the autoimmune, undesired autoimmune effect for cancer immunotherapy treatment. So that's where we start with. And we're talking about, especially at the national cohort, there's no such uh, study available. So in our case, well, the reason availability of big uh, electron health data at the population level enables the large scale study for a situation like this. And to study especially rare or emerging treatment, medical treatment. In, uh, in our case, uh, available to us is our uh, de-identified national insurance cohort that covers 44 million members in the United States. And the insurance data provides a diagnosis code and procedure treatment and a pharmaceutical paid treatment and so on, pharmaceutical uh, prescription and so on. It also in, 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 uh, includes the patient's uh, zip code, for example, and demographics and enrollment and, and so on. So out of this 44 million member record, where there are roughly 97,000 patients, lung cancer patients. And um, among them, we find roughly a, a little bit over 2,000 patients have received immunotherapy. And another 30, 30, 37,000 received chemotherapy. So this picture illustrated what's going on. Remember, the first immunotherapy drug, PD-1, uh, on PD-1, L1, is approved in tw late 2014. And now this picture shows the shows the arri arrival of the cancer immunotherapy treatment. The gray bar is chemotherapy, pretty much stable before, and fluctuate now started going down. And the, the, all, the yellow bar is all immunotherapy treatment in this database. And the, red, uh, the, the green bar and the blue bar are the two dominant immunotherapy treat, uh, drugs. What, Kichuda is the blue one, and green one is Optivo. And it's interesting that you see from this picture, you already, you already start to see a regime change. Uh, before 2015, pretty much everybody is on uh, chemotherapy. There's only less than 50, less than 50 patients patient, patient receiving immunotherapy. But as you go onward, you realize that the total immunotherapy started to become on par with chemotherapy. As a fact, matter of fact, right now it's roughly 50-50 if you keep on going for 2018. So that you see a regime changing of treat lung cancer treatment. And now, what, in this case, we're studying, we're trying to study the effect of immunotherapy, the autoimmune undesired consequences of immunotherapy. So naturally, what do you do? Well, now you have two group of populations. It seems sort of the rest of the story will be straightforward. We, now have, we have two group of patients, immunotherapy patients versus chemotherapy patients. Oh, well, we check the difference in the main outcomes. Let's, from the init, treatment initiali initialization, how long does it take them to develop autoimmune disease. For a patient, a patient might never de develop autoimmune disease, then that's a sensor data. And it might take the patient three months to develop autoimmune disease and so on. So naturally, and then you can assign causal relationship. That sounds like, sounds like a very natural thing to do. And as a matter of fact, you can even do plot, calculate p-values and so on. So this plot shows, this is so-called Kaplan-Meier curve, the probability of patient not having autoimmune disease three months, for example, six months after the initial, initialization of the treatment. And the fact is that you, you look at the curve, the uh, chemotherapy curve is above the autoimmune, autoimmune, uh, immunotherapy curve. That basically tells that uh, fewer patients are have from a chemotherapy treatment uh, have, are reporting uh, 
onset of autoimmune disease compared with the immunotherapy disease. As a matter of fact, you can also calculate the p-values using uh, on, based on Kaplan-Meier curve and so on. Well, does this another sound typical or sound similar? As a matter of fact, a lot, in a lot of uh, medical analysis, you encounter a picture like this, survival curve, the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, then they calculate p-value. But I have to say, this is naive at best. This type, even, you can calculate, even if you can calculate p-value, that's actually naive at best. Because fundamentally, we're talking about the causal relationship. We're, we're, uh, we're arguing that uh, immunotherapy might or may not lead to cause more autoimmune disease. We're talking about causal relationship. So to illustrate what, what is going on, what's wrong with this type of analysis, let's take an extreme case. Let's take a kind of uh, case, talk about, let's take a hypothetical case. Let's see the healthcare effect of green tea, okay? Claim green tea is good for good for you. Uh, this, in this case, you can back up. You can even back up this with some data. For example, two populations: the Japanese versus the Americans. Uh, observation: uh, Japanese drinks a lot more tea than Americans. Uh, green teas, and they they are the observation. Uh, the ha Japanese have a much higher life expectancy than Americans, and overall cancer rate is much lower in the Japanese population. Uh, I think I've reversed the order. This two, the numbers should be reversed. 201 versus 335. I accidentally typo. And therefore, green tea is good for you. As a matter of fact, you can back up with, if you want, you can back up the survival curves and so on, even calculate p-value to justify this. But, but what went wrong with this analysis? Well, first, what went wrong, what I would say this is not naive at best. First, what went wrong is that we're talking all cancer types. Now let's zoom in. For a lot of the cancers, indeed, U.S. rate is higher than the Japanese rate. But it's not so. If you look at liver cancer, Japanese case is twice more likely to develop liver, liver cancer. For stomach, it's five times as high. Well, now you start questioning. Green tea is something actually you swallow to your stomach. Now you have a high problem stomach cancer. Does this really mean, this might you believe more than skin cancer, for example. Okay, what's going on? Well, that's only the part of the iceberg. The fundamental question is that, the fundamental question is that I can, sub, I can substitute, substitute green tea by a lot of other things. For example, sushi. The Japanese eat a lot more, lot more sushi than Americans, and, but they have a lot higher expectancy, lower cancer rate. Therefore, sushi is good for you. You can argue for the same thing. So fundamentally, the underlying problem for, for this type of argument, for this type of calculation, or this type of p-value calculation to justify whatever is there, is because these two populations they are trying to talk about treatment versus control. The two populations are fundamentally different. The environment is different, the lifestyle is different, the family structure is different, the diet is different, the genetics are different. So you can't, there's tons of hundreds of millions of uh, differences you can talk about. Therefore. In this case, that actually no way you can assign causal relationship. But unfortunately, in a lot of pop, pop cultures, in a lot of medias, we see this type of analysis all the time. For example, someday you might say, tomato is good for you. Why tomato is good for you? Look at a small village in Italy where people eat a lot of tomatoes. They have people happy, people have low cancer rate, and so on. therefore tomato is good for you. This type of analysis, this type of story you see a lot from medias. So in my opinion, the right way to think about Causal inference is really the potential outcome framework. So here's a basic idea. So every unit has a potential outcome under different conditions, under assignment, diff assignment for the conditions. For example, here's a concrete example. John taking green tea or versus not taking green tea. Taking green tea three months later, you, you find John's blood pressure was lowered down by five points. Whereas if John don't take green tea, three months later, his blood, uh, blood pressure increased by five points. Then we see the difference, 10, is drinking green tea, in John's case, he can lower his uh, blood pressure by 10 points. So the difference or contrast between John's, can, John's out, potential outcome under the two different conditions, that is what we, we can contribute as a causal effect of this particular condition. And this idea looks like a very transparent. Yeah, actually, it's not a, it, it has a relatively short history compared with the 
whole history of science. And this, wrong, uh, this idea has been around since 1900. For example, R. Fisher, the founding father of modern statistics and the founding father of modern theoretical genetics. This is what he said impl implicitly, what he wrote implicitly uh, talking about this type of idea, causal effect back in 1918. This is what he said. If we say this boy has grown tall because being well fed, we're, more, we're not merely tracing out the cause and effect in the individual instance. We're suggesting that he might quite probably have been worse fed, and that in this case, he, he would have been shorter. So you see that uh, Ari Fisher back in 1918 is already talking about potential outcome. If this, if this boy is well fed versus not well fed, then we, if we trace the difference years back, years in the future, then we can assign whether his uh, height and so on, his growth in his height, to the initial condition, that is, it's well fed or not well fed. And, but it has, history has waited until 1974. Don Rubin, my colleague at Harvard State Department, the first person to explicitly specify out this potential outcome framework. And so, to put it in a nutshell, the, we talk about potential uh, causal effect for individual. Now we have a population. We can talk about the causal effect for the population. For example, John, the causal effect of John taking green tea is to minus his blood pressure by 10 points. The causal effect for George, who is who taking green tea, is actually not very good for George. He increases his blood pressure by four, five points and so on. But then the fundament, then we encounter the improbable, the fundamental problem of causal inference. That is. In reality, we only observe one arm. John is drinking green tea. We don't observe what's going on if John is not drinking green tea. So in other words, we cannot go back to time and watch the parallel universe. We only have one universe, we only one time evolution. We don't have that. Then, that's crazy. So at least half of the data are missing if you under the call the inference framework. So what do you do? Well, they, one of them, most profound idea of tackling this problem is do matching. We cannot go back to time. However, if we can find a member or multiple members in the control arm that matches John to a large extent, then we can use their value to substitute for the missing value that we're looking after. For example, supposing that in the extreme case, John has identical twin who looks otherwise like John in every aspect, except this identical twin is not drinking green tea. Then we can attribute the effect. This, we can reasonably confident to fill this number to, to John's case under not drinking green tea. Well, in reality, we are not, uh, in reality, we are not that lucky. We don't have the identical twin situation. So in reality, we need to think, of, in order to fill the missing data using matching, we have, to feel, we have to think very carefully about decision makers and what are the key covariates that we use to make treatment decisions. And then we, can find, we try to find sub subgroups in which the treatment and the control groups have good balance. By good balance, we mean essentially the balance of all the important observed covariates. Then we can try to study the causal relationship. We can use the potential outcome to study the relationship. Okay, now let, let's get back to the immunotherapy study. What are the important covariates in this case? Well, we talk about on, oncologists, some of the obvious uh, important covariates of the age, sex, and its ethnicity. That's sort of obvious, and young people and uh, old people respond, potentially respond differently, and as different genetic makeup respond differently, but there are also social economic import, status important. The wealth, the wealthy people and the low-income people respond differently because their lifestyle is different. They want to control for that. And the way, we don't have a social economic status, but we do have the median income of each zip code and the median unemployment rate in each zip code. That's from US Census. We can use that information to, as a proxy for social economic status because for each member, we have their zip code. Healthcare utilization. Some people are more health conscious. Whatever disease they have, whatever condition they have, they go check the hospital. Some people don't want to go to the hospital. Maybe 10, they go to the hospital every 10 years or something. So these two people, this type of group, people, you, you don't want to match each other. We want to be very, you want to be very careful. So our, what we use, we don't have the healthcare utilization, something called but healthcare utilization, but we have a proxy. Proxy will be annualized member, annualized number of hospitals prior to treatment initialization. That gives you a way to approximate healthcare utilization. Then you also want to, uh, the key covariate will be the general thickness of the patient. 
clearly you don't want to compare a healthy patient versus relatively healthy patient versus relatively poor patient and uh, relatively unhealthy patient, then what is a proxy for that? Well, we use annualized number of disease codes, disease code counts in the data set as a proxy. And if a sick patient tend, tend to have a lot of uh, disease codes in the database in, for this patient, you use that to do the matching. Okay, so here's, for each patient in the immunotherapy group, we can find multiple matches. We generally can find about multiple matches in the control group. In the control group, I mean chemotherapy group. And then, for example, Sarah has six, uh, find six matches, and then we assign one six to each of the match. So we are, we're talking about the weighted population. Matched population, but also matched, control, or matched uh, treatment control uh, with, with weight. And now, here, here's the effect of matching. How uh, the red curves are what happens before matching. If you look at, the, see, if you look at these two points, you realize that before matching, indeed, the treatment and control patients are very different from each other. The chemotherapy patients tend to be a lot sicker, and the chemotherapy patients tend to be utilize healthcare facilities a lot more than the immunotherapy patient. But after matching, you become reasonable. And then you can look for the individual immunotherapy drugs. Kichuda, again, after matching, seems to be a lot, lot better. And this Opdivo, Opdivo, after matching, seems a lot better. So now you, we can go back to study. Now we, we're talking about matched control pattern, matched treatment versus control with, uh, with weight. Now you can, do, you can calculate the Kaplan-Meier curve, and you can, we can also calculate the p-values. And how does this compare with the unmatched? Well, you, you see that un, for the unmatched, the p-value is 0 0.001, but under the matching, the p-value is 0 0.009. So in other words, if without doing matching, the two populations are very different from each other. And you artificially sort of generate a more significant signal. You point your p-value, you think of point zero zero one, actually it's point zero one. You re, the p-value is actually 10 times as higher than what you saw before. And so I don't, this is not something you want to trust, but this is more trustworthy after post-matching. And we can look at, uh, we can look at autoimmune effect for individual treatment. For example, Kichuda, one drug Kichuda, the other drug Optivo. We see, you see curves as well, as, uh, you can see curves similarly. You can also calculate uh, the p-value. Uh, furthermore, you can talk, Autoimmune disease is actually a big, a big class of diseases. There are 23 different types, different categories of autoimmune disease, from thyroiditis to type 1 diabetes to uh, chronic hepatitis uh, to inflammatory bowel disease and so on. That's actually 23 different, different groups, categories together. So now you can look at the individual disease types and so on. Now the curves, become, now we have a lot of curves, 23 different individual curves to look at under, for different treatment. So I will just, uh, for my time, I'm just show so one typical picture. And out of the 23 uh, autoimmune disease categories, 22, for the 22, 22 out of 23, indeed we will observe that immunotherapy has higher chance to lead to autoimmune disease. Out of 23, 22 of them have the effect like this. Thyroiditis is the most pronounced. In this case, this is a, this is a, a kaplan meier curve for immunotherapy. This is the kaplan meier curve for chemotherapy. So in, indeed, we see that very significantly having an immunotherapy treatment leads to more significantly more thyroiditis and so on. And that, that's one exceptional case out of 23. That is type 1 diabetes. In the type 1 diabetes case, that's the only case that the, the, the relation between the two curves flipped over. So we have less type 1 diabetes incidence from immunotherapy patient versus the chemotherapy patient. Actually, this can be well explained by well-documented uh, side effects, uh, the pancreatitis toxicity for chemotherapy. That's well-documented. And then chemotherapy disrupts the, uh, the blood sugar homostatus. So, so this can well be attributed to this specifically doctor already noted uh, effect of chemotherapy. Okay. Now my time is up, so let's sum up. Sum up. So what we find, based on this large data set, patient immunotherapy are more likely to develop autoimmune disease. So this essentially suggests that when doctors do immunotherapy for cancer patient, doctors should watch out for immunotherapy consequences, should pay attention. And secondly, immunotherapy 
generally have a high chance. Uh, immunotherapy, in terms of specific disease, uh, immunotherapy tr treatment had a high risk of getting autoimmune-related thyroiditis. On the other hand, a patient on chemotherapy had a slightly higher chance of developing type 1 diabetes. That's what we observe from data set. Uh, to draw a conclusion, I, in my, this is my adventure, in, uh, this is my, our adventure in the big medical data. And we do think that big data presents great opportunities, especially to study real, real disease, real treatment, or emerging treatment, in this case, ca cancer immunotherapy. And I also want to say that size does matter. 44 million make a big difference from like 1,000 patients and so on. But in my opinion, the careful analysis, careful statistical analysis and careful statistical thinking really makes, makes critical difference for you to draw reliable, trustworthy uh, con uh, conclusions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Mark. Hello. How are you? Sam. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Yes. If you go back a couple of slides, uh, well, even there, the lower one, this, the effect size is very small. In most of the y-axis on your plots, do you, I mean, I know that you've done the statistical analysis, and yes. it shows that the, the, both populations are distinct. But is that a meaningful, if, if you as a patient were treated with one of these drugs, would you feel more threatened because you go from 0.995 to point, well, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, this is actually not a long for us. If you read all the medical journals, and people, people typically don't present this type of picture, it something called odds ratio. Right. That's basically the ratio between 0 0.001 versus 0 0.00001. So basically, you see like one tenfold odds ratio. That big, if you see an odds ratio about one, significant about one, chance that, that if you're talking about some disease, chance that you can make it to New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA. That's not a, a whole story alone. That happens pr pretty pr prevalent in all the medical journals and so on. So you're looking for uh, even about one, significant about one odds ratio. So in this case, I would say. Depend, depend on what your expectation about this. Of course, you have, you're talking about the life-threatening condition. Even if you get, for a patient, if, uh, if you are talking about whether you want to live or die in three months versus you got an immune, immune response, also immune disease in three months, probably, I would know, depend on each individual patient choice. The doctor would suggest, yes, even, even if you want to develop, you might get a chance to develop autoimmune disease. Maybe you want to still go for immunotherapy because that might save your life. Right. And, but, but later on, if you, the, you have truly informed the patient that you have a higher chance, you ha this, the, the, they have a higher chance of developing autoimmune disease versus classical chemotherapy. So if you, you shouldn't be surprised if later on you get a chance, you develop a thyroiditis and so on. So that's actually the story about all the uh, medical studies. As a matter of fact, if you study the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, you see stuff like this also. And you, you, you smoke for, for you know, five years, the chance of developing lung cancer is minute. Right. But we all know you should, we should avoid smoking. If you want to, we all know smoking causes lung cancer. So that's along the story here. Right. And so one, uh, second, uh, the second question and final is uh, in the medical community, the reputation of electronic health records is that they are very good at tracking billing, meaning they're very good for hospital management. But in principle, people record ICD codes, which are the describing whether a patient has a specific disease, in ways to protect the hospital from spending more or less money, as opposed to reflecting accurately what a person is, uh, you know, uh, d describing the person's uh, health. Um, so I wonder how you guys are planning on. Because reviewers and even the general public who, who knows about this, how do you defend your study uh, and say, well, you know, this matching, it, it, it's, it's a great methodological piece, but perhaps on, on, on data that's 
that has ba a, a bad reputation as the world of mine? Well, uh, uh, that's actually a good question. The, the electronic health record or medical insurance data like this it was not designed for research for us to study disease uh, cure or association. The original uh, that idea is to for efficiency of processing, internal processing hospital, for the doctor enter your patient ID and so on. Then you to get all your past record treatment in the same hospital. That's our initial design. But a side consequence or a good part is that it also opened up if you want, of course, you have to anonymize, pro protect the patient privacy and so on. But it opens the, your door to access a large amount of information. And that, that amount of information can well lead to a novel medical treatment, novel uh, discoveries and that can you know, prevent disease and so on. So I think that's actually a good part of in, electronic health record and medical record. And specific, as you said, um, the, the devil's in the details, right? And so in this particular case, and actually the fundamental question, a uh, very simple question would be, what's the definite, what is lung cancer patient? How do you define lung cancer patient in this case? Because if you, that's actually related to what you say, what you, the question is, the insurance, if you look at the insurance data set, this only talk about disease code. We only talk about disease uh, procedure code and um, medication code. It, that, there's no column say this guy is a lung cancer patient and that guy is not a lung cancer patient. They actually, there's also no mentioning of whether this guy is an autoimmune disease patient. That guy is autoimmune. So you have to find out. So how do you find this? How do you identify who is a lung cancer patient? That has that actually something has to go behind it. And it's not just that this guy. This guy did a lung autopsy, then therefore this guy is lung cancer patient. The answer is no. This guy might be a healthy guy, just the doctor suspects something. In the end, the results that shows different. Then this shouldn't be treated as lung cancer patient. So you have to be careful about, about even the, your definition of lung cancer patient, your definition of the chemotherapy patient, your definition of immunotherapy patient as the same thing. So when you deal with this data, type of data, you have to be very careful. For example, this is our logic of identification of lung cancer patient. It's not just mentioning once. Just talk, not only talk about diagnosis criterion, actually the diagnosis criterion, procedure criterion, and pharmacy criterion. So our definition is that at least you have to observe three independent claims meeting one of these criterion, or two mentioning of, uh, two mentioning of, of the criterion, two, uh, two independent claims records in at least two separate groups, that give us confidence we're indeed talking about lung cancer patient. Another case will be, we have to be very careful. You, what's studying the caudal effect, so you want to rule out all the patients that already have autoimmune disease. Then you cannot, obviously you cannot see this is caused by cancer treatment. So when you define the patient cohort, you have to rule out all the patients that already have autoimmune disease. So that has to be ruled out. Another thing has to be ruled out is that what if this patient so it's new to this insurance database. And then from, from the first week, the patient starts to re, uh, receiving cancer treatment. Then for this patient, you also want to be careful because maybe this pre, prior to joining this new insurance plan, this patient already have started cancer treatment. So you want to have a quiet period that it, indeed for the first two or three months, nothing going on. Then you are confident that this is actually new lung cancer patient rather than a lung cancer patient already struggling with lung cancer for three years in the back. So that's a lot of nitty gritty details for this type of things. And, and okay, this is exposure and so on. So indeed the data are messy. But pre-processing, understanding what I'm looking for, that actually takes months for you to investigate the data set. So data is dirty, data is not clean. And as a matter of fact, you spend 40 or 50% of effort cleaning the data, try to understand what is the data, how do you extract our information, then you can carry out the status analysis. So the answer is that this data is not well prepared for research. If you want to do research there, you have to be careful. You have to do a lot of pre-processing and pre-studying. Oh yes, that's indeed. That's actually already. That's all, that's what FDA. When FDA approves the drug, you have to do double clean. Uh, in terms, of, there's different measurement. First, prolong the patient life or reduce the tumor size. In both are reported, and both actually for Ketruda, for example, that's report. There are two clinical trials, two studies reported in New England Journal of Medicine. And also journals, uh, there are also articles reported in Lancet and so on that basically talk about the clinical trials before the drug get approved by FDA. They do run a clinical trial. But the clinical trial typically you involve less than 100 patients. 
randomly assign one through the screw, one through two seconds. No, but in this, uh, this type of data, do you have uh, some estimates on that or? Uh, that's, a, uh, uh, that's actually a good question. I, I, I think we roughly, we didn't do a careful analysis, but we roughly find it's consistent. And it uh, prolongs the patient life by a few months on average. It's not like save your lives by years. That's a, on average. Prolongs patient life by three months to six months or something like that. And, but that's also a problem is that we also have a strong sensoring going on. So all the drugs, pretty much, you see the vast majority of the data we have are from 2016 and onward. So now we only have two years afterward before that. We have a lot of sensoring going on. So our estimate is based on the sensoring and so on. 